one. Oh, man, uh, good evening. This is my Wednesday night Bible study. I'm just always shocked that I can never remember dated. March 10th. We are in. My name is Doug Griffin. We are in the book of Matthew. We've been going through from the beginning, and uh, of Matthew, not from the beginning of time. And now we're in Matthew chapter 24. Jesus has been warning and warning and warning um, about this coming destruction of the temple. And so he's giving a clue as to when they can expect it to happen. So he says this a particular phrase uh, that kind of started us off. And so um, I'm going to back up to that phrase in just a, in just a second. But I, I do want to... Um, bring up the fact that I mentioned a certain sort of prayer last week called, we in America would say imprecatory prayer. Uh, in England, they say imprecatory prayer and uh, like intercessory prayer. So they, they say, we say it wrong. Um, but it's, it's a prayer that you see in the Bible mostly from David where um, people are being judged for their behavior against God and against God's people. And there's a type of judgment you're praying down on people. Now, we don't do that. We never, it's very rare that we do that. That's why we don't hear this type of prayer being talked about a lot because we're supposed to not judge people and not, you know, and to love them, et cetera, et cetera. But there are times when God has actually um, warned and warned and warned and warned someone or a group of people or a generation of people about their behavior. And now it's time to say, hey, judgment is coming. And um, David did that when he saw. So, so here's some examples of, of David. So we, we read it in the Bible a lot and we just didn't know that it had a name. Like, for example, in Psalm chapter 55 verse 15 in Psalm 55 15 it says let death seize them let them go down alive into hell for wickedness is their dwellings and among them so wickedness is in their dwellings and among them so he's talking about a group of particularly horrible people that he said it's time for judgment to come down on them in, in Psalm 69 28 says, let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. In Psalm 109, 8, it says, let his days be few and let another take his office. Psalm 35, 6, let their way be dark and slippery and let the angel of the Lord pursue them. And he's talking about the enemies who are coming against God and against God's people and, and, and let their way be dark and slippery and let the angel of the Lord pursue them so that bad things come on them. Now, these are scriptures. This is the Holy Scriptures. And, and again, we don't pray this way. This is not normally how we pray, but there's very rare occasions where apparently it's appropriate to do this sort of thing. In Psalm uh, 58, verse 6, it says, Break their teeth in their mouth, O God. Break out the fangs of the young lions, O Lord. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, it's a certain type, and this is called Im imprecatory prayer or imp imprecatory prayer. It's the opposite of intercessory prayer. In intercessory prayer, uh, someone has sinned or some bad thing is coming upon someone and God sees it. Of course, he sees it because he invented the laws uh, that are causing it to happen. For example, like the law of gravity. So something's falling. God invented that law of gravity. He'll point it out to us. Look, that's about to crash. It's a terrible thing that's about to happen there. And ask us to intercede so that judgment doesn't happen because this particular person or group of people are not able to intercede for themselves. So there's a sort of intercessory prayer where we stand in the gap for someone who's not able to. We say, Lord, protect them. And Lord, we pray protection. So that's the majority of what we're going to be doing as far as praying for somebody else is praying, interceding on their behalf. But there are times in the Bible where you could, God, in order to be praying God's will, you're actually praying down judgment on someone. Very rare, right? 
when did that happen? It can't just happen according to when we just get mad at somebody. It has to be the Spirit of God moving on you and saying, okay, now you're praying God to judgment. These people have just gone against you. Which basically, these Pharisees... So, the two times that the temple in Israel was destroyed, and it was destroyed on the same day, both times, the ninth of Ab, years apart, God sent warning after warning after warning, hundreds of years of warnings, and then finally he said, judgment is, is coming. And so when we see Jesus go into the temple, curse the fig tree, come out of the temple, it's that same warning he's giving, except in this case, he says, okay, that's it. And and he's asking the disciples to pray this imprecatory or precatory prayer. Uh, so here's where we were. Um, Jesus in Matthew 24, verse uh, 32 says, now learn this parable from the fig tree. And last week we were totally examining that parable. Uh, when I was, so in the 70s, when I first really got turned on to uh, witnessing, and I, in my church, at my elementary school, when I grew up, everybody I knew was in church. Obviously, at church, everybody was in church. And when I went to school on Monday morning in, in elementary school, we'd all talk about all the great stuff that happened at church. Ooh, a lady shouted, and this happened. Everybody I knew was in church. I didn't know any unsaved people. I thought that unsaved people were these fictional people that were just out there somewhere. No one I knew didn't go to church and wasn't saved. Once I got to high school, <laughs> I said, oh, there are unsaved people. And, um, and, I started reading some books that said that Jesus was coming back any day. And I thought, oh no, these unsaved people who are friends of mine, they they don't know what's about to happen to them. Uh, these books were based upon this one scripture. When Jesus says, now learn this parable, parable of the fig tree. So I, I, I want to read you a, a selection, in fact, from one of them. Um, the founder of Calvary, Calvary Chapel his name was Chuck Smith, and he published a book called The End Times in 1979. And in this book, he wrote, If I understand scripture correctly, Jesus taught us that the generation which sees the budding of the fig tree, the birth of the nation of Israel, will be the generation that sees the Lord's return. I believe that the generation of 1948 is the last generation. Since a generation of judgment is 40 years and the tribulation lasts seven years, I believe the Lord could come back for his church any time before the tribulation starts, which would mean any time before 1981. Uh, so how, because he, and he has a little uh, illustration in there because Israel became a nation in 48 and then 40 years later would be 88. So 88 minus seven, he says is 81. So anytime before 1981, Jesus will definitely come back. So I'm reading this in 1979, think, oh, I only got two years. I gotta go, I gotta find everybody. Okay, so here's the rest of from this book called The End Times. However, it is possible that Jesus is dating the beginning of the generation from 1967, when Jerusalem was again under Israeli control for the first time since 587 BC. We don't know for sure which year actually marks the beginning of the last generation. And the reason he chooses 1967 is that that's the year that a, a war broke out in Israel and they took possession of the entire land, including the West Bank and that whole area that's now under dispute with the Palestinians, everything they took directly. So in 1967, after that set six day war, now they control the entire land, right? So he's saying it could be dating from there, in which case Jesus, the tribulation would start in the year 2000. So uh, now, the same viewpoint was published in the popular by pa popular pastor Hal Lindsey in his widely published book, The Late Great Planet Earth. And all of this teaching that came about, which still, I say at least, at least half the Christian world still thinks this way, uh, is based on this one scripture when Jesus says, let's consider the fig tree, the parable of the fig tree. So that's why I'm going to go back and examine exactly what the parable of the fig tree is. Because he says, when you see it budding, then you know that summer is nigh. 
She says, so you're smart enough. When you see the fig tree starting to bud, everybody knows. And we all know that today. We can look around and tell when it's when summer's close. Oh, look, those trees are blossoming. Yeah, it's probably summer's coming. Jesus says, you, you, you can tell. You don't know the exact day it's going to happen, that summer's going to start. Uh, but you can tell it's happening. And he says, so just like you can tell when summer's coming, you'll be able to tell when judgment is coming. But they interpret this as saying, that the fig tree represents Israel. Well, and they just totally misunderstood it. I'll, I'll, I'll explain later what they meant. So, but let's look up so that we know what Jesus meant because they were totally <laughs> using this scripture to say this is when this means when Israel becomes a nation. So, when you see the fig tree, the fig tree stands for Israel becoming a nation, the birth of Israel as a nation. Let's see if that makes any sense. So, Matthew twenty one verse 12 through 13. And, and last week I gave a lot of background and, and, and a friend of mine talked to me and said, boy, you make it sound like you, you, the only way that you can understand the Bible is if you have studied Hebrew and Greek and, and know all these things, you know. And I, I said, oh, you know, you're right. I don't mean to make it sound like that because you don't have to have studied. I just gave a whole bunch of background last week because it's interesting to me. But, but just common sense. We can just read through and we can tell what Jesus meant and what was going on. So I want to read it that way without all the background and everything, the historical background, just reading the scriptures. Okay, so Matthew 21, verse 12 says, Then Jesus went into the temple of God and he drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it the den of thieves. So obviously he's upset, right? And you're doing, they're doing something wrong in the temple. It doesn't take, you don't have to study Hebrew and Greek to tell. Jesus is turning over the tables. He says, you've made it, uh, it's, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And that's what it says uh, in Isaiah. Um, it shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations that one day my temple and, and he really means his temple, Jesus, will be open and, and, and be a temple for all the nations. Not that there's going to be some gigantic temple somewhere that everybody in the earth is going to fit inside. Um, but he said, so that's, the, that's what it's supposed to be, uh, a house of prayer for all the nations. But you've made it in the, in the thieves. Now, he's quoting Jeremiah chapter 7. We were reading through that. We only actually got halfway through. So I'm going to remind us what we read last week. So we only got halfway through. But he's quoting Jeremiah 7. And you, you read this yourself and go, oh, I know exactly what that means. So it says, do not trust in these lying words saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. That's Jeremiah 7 beginning in verse 4. So don't, don't trust in lying words saying, oh, I, the temple of the Lord is my protection. Don't do that, he says. Right? That's easy. Verse 8, behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incest, the veil, and walk after other gods whom you do not know? And then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, even I, I've seen it, says the Lord. So Jesus is quoting this Jeremiah thing. Because and Jeremiah is saying this to them right before the first temple got destroyed. He says, you come and you do horrible things. And you don't have to know Greek and Hebrew. You come in and do horrible things, abominations, commit adulteries, all that stuff. And then you walk into the house of the Lord and say, oh, we, look, we've got the, we're in the house of the Lord. So we're protected. He says, nope, you're making it into a den of thieves. Thieves go off and do horrible stuff. And then they, their den is where they come together and collect all their money. They don't steal from each other in the den. That's where they bring all the loot that they've stolen. And, and Jesus had been yelling at the Pharisees and saying, you are you do horrible things to widows and you, you take their houses from them and you're cheating the orphans and the straight. You're doing all these horrible things. You're cheating these people and you're bringing all that money into the house of God and splitting it among yourselves. So he's been yelling at the Pharisees the same way Jeremiah was yelling at them. And he's saying, you've made this that den of thieves, just like Jeremiah said about the first temple. Let's keep reading. Verse 12, but go now to my place, which is which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. So even if you don't know the history of Shiloh, you could tell he must have done something bad to Shiloh. And I'll just tell you, yes, that's what when they first built the temple, 
uh, and, and brought the tabernacle over. They acted up horribly. This was in the north. God destroyed it. Uh, and he's saying, remember, see me what I did to Shiloh? I'm doing the same thing to you. Uh, so, and now because you've done all these works, says the Lord, and I spoke to you, rising up early and speaking, but you did not hear, and I called you, but you did not answer. Therefore, I will do to the house, which is called by name, by my name, in which you trust, and to this place, which I gave to you and your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. I'm going to do the same thing to them and do to you. And I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all your brethren, the whole prosperity of Ephraim, and Ephraim is the northern tribe. So just like I did to the people in the north, I'm going to do down here in the south. So when, if Jesus is quoting this and saying, you turned it into a den of thieves, he's saying the same thing is going to happen to you. Just like Jeremiah warned them, I'm warning you. So right after that, he goes into, after you've gone into the temple and delivered their curse. You're going to be cursed. He didn't just cleanse the temple. He cursed the temple because he's quoting Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was cursing the temple. In Matthew 28, verse 18 through 22, it says, Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. And he said to it, Let no fruit grow on you ever again. And, and immediately the fig tree withered away. So he's just cursed the temple, and now he's cursing the fig tree. Because there's no fruit, right? Just leaves. Of course, people think, why is he so mad at the fig tree? He's giving a physical illustration of a spiritual truth that just happened. He's cursed the temple. Now they don't; it, it didn't just suddenly crumble. So it's like, how do we how do we know that what you, when you just get that curse? How do we know it's going to happen? He steps outside, curses the fig tree, and you get you know there, there's no fruit. You're just this empty tree. I'm going to curse you. That's his example. That's his physical example. So they can see an example. So the disciples can see, see what I did this victory? That's what I just did to the temple, even though they don't see it yet. It's going to take a while before it withers away and totally crumbles. But what I just did to this victory is what I just did to the temple. So um, it says, and when the disciples saw it, that the, that the fig tree was cursed and withered away, they marveled, saying, how did the fig tree wither away so soon? So Jesus answered and said to them, assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree. So you'll not only curse the fig tree, because that's what he just did to the fig tree. He cursed it and he withered. So that's what he's telling them. You're going to have power to do curse things, because that's what they, he just did. You will not only do that, curse the fig tree. Remember, Jesus said, let's learn from the parable of the fig tree. Well, the fig tree cursed and died. I was taught that somehow the parable of the fig tree was about Israel growing and becoming a nation, but it's clearly about Israel dying, right? So, and specifically the temple. I'm not even talking about all of Israel. Okay. You will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. What mountain? This mountain. This I just came. We just came out of the Temple Mount. Did we not just come out of that mountain that, where the where the Temple is built? If you say to that mountain that I just cursed, I just cursed the Temple. Say to that mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. That's a curse. That's not a wonderful thing. <laughs> That's a bad thing. Then it will be done. So he's saying, you you're going to do the same curse that I did. He's inviting them to imprecatory prayer. He's, in, he's saying, see how I curse them? You're going to do the same thing. And you're going to even say to this mountain, be removed and be cast down and cast into the sea. Because we're going to, we're casting, calling out judgment on the temple because of their abominations. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. So let's go on to go back to Jeremiah, continue reading because Jesus, that's what's on his mind. And that's what should have been on the disciples mind. Therefore, Jeremiah 7, verse 16, do not pray for these people, nor lift up a cry or prayer for them. Well, he just said, don't pray for them. He says, and, and also don't pray for them. Do not pray for these people, nor lift up a prayer for them. Well, those are two different words. It sounds like he's repeating himself. Do not pray for these people and do not pray for them. One is pray and one is plead for them. Do not pray or plead for them. Uh, and they're two different things. 
But that's what the literal Hebrew is. Do not pray or plead or cry or plead for these people, nor make intercession to me, for I will not hear you. So I'm not, so don't make intercessory prayer. Do the other kind, because they're opposites. Don't say, Lord, stop the judgment. Say, Lord, bring the judgment. Uh, and that's exactly what Jesus is saying uh, in Mark eleven twenty four, 24, uh, I'll do that version of it. In Mark eleven twenty four, he says, therefore, because he says, you not only, you'll not only speak out a curse of this fig tree, you know, but you also say to this mountain be removed and you cast into the sea. So you'll also crumble that mountain. Therefore, this is Mark's version of the therefore, I say to you all things for which you pray and ask, pray and plead. They, because it's confusing, Pray and plead, that's the same thing, but it's not. Uh, they translate what things ever you ask for in prayer, but that's, it doesn't really say in prayer. It, ever, it says whatever you ask for and pray for, <laughs> but they translate it ask for in prayer because it was confusing to the translator. They didn't realize that Jesus was quoting Jeremiah where he says, do not pray and plead for these people. So he says, whatever things for which you pray and plead for, uh, so don't pray and plead for them, obviously pray and plead against them. Believe that you've received them and you'll be, it'll be granted unto you. So this verse that's always been used to say, you can have a Cadillac, is not, not what it's talking about. You can have a television, just pray and believe. That's not what this verse is talking about. Yes, Jesus will bless Yes, Jesus will uh, 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 grant our prayers. There are other scriptures that talk about that. If we pray anything according to his will, we have the petitions we've desired. But that's not what this is asking for. Right now, Jesus is asking for an imprecatory prayer to curse, right? And, and, in, and that's why in Matthew 6.10, he says, After this manner, pray come thy will be done we're supposed to pray for god's will 99.9 .9 of the time god's will of course is mercy it's grace it's love that point oh 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 one percent of the time it's judgment because it's been 700 years that he's been waiting for you to get it together and now it's just time to say okay right back to jeremiah chapter 7 verse 20 because this is what jesus is quoting from therefore thus says the lord god behold my anger and my fury will be poured out on this place on man and on beast, on the trees of the field and on the fruit of the ground, it will burn and not be quenched. And so he's saying, do not pray or intercede for them because my fury is going to be poured out on them. So obviously that's what you want to, thy will be done. If I'm telling you my will is judgment, then you have to say, okay, thy will be done. We don't want to. We don't. But if, if sometimes he's saying, no, I'm sorry, it's been 700 years, so I have to judge them. But that's a rare thing. It happens once every 700 years. Right? So um, now, Jeremiah chapter 8. I'm just skipping over to there because we want to understand this part too. It says, were they ashamed? This is Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 12. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No. They were not ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall in the time of their punishment. They shall be cast down, says the Lord. And I will surely consume them, says the Lord. No grape shall be on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree. So in that same Jeremiah speech, he talks about the fig tree. There'll be no figs on the fig tree, and the leaf shall fade and wither, and the things I have given them shall pass away from them. So... That's another reason why Jesus went to the fig tree was because he's quoting from that passage in Jeremiah that he gave right before there was um, judgment of the temple. And in that part, he says, there'll be no more grapes on the vine. There'll be no figs on the fig tree. They shall fade. They shall wither. So Jesus goes to the fig tree just so they can't. I wonder if they have that, that same scripture. Yes. Okay. Back to Matthew 21, verse 19. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves, and said to it, 
let no fruit grow on you ever again. And immediately the fig tree withered away, right? Now, going on to verse 23. So he goes back to the temple. Now, when he came back to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confirmed, confronted him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? So this is when Jesus, again, makes it clear what he's talking about. He's not talking about Israel becoming a nation. He's talking about the destruction of the temple. Uh, so by what authority do you do this? So Matthew 21, verse 28 through 31, Jesus says, I'll, he, I, well, when he says, when they said, what, by what authority? He says, okay, what authority did John have to do what he did when John the Baptist was out preaching? And they go, well, we don't want to say. He says, well, then I don't want to tell you. If you won't be admit, then, then we have nothing to talk about. But let me ask you another question. He says, what do you think? A man had two sons. This is Matthew 28, 1, 21, verse 28. A man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and says, oh, I go, sir. But he did not go. He's got two sons. Please go. No. But later he does it. Then he talks to another son and says, uh, I want you to go. And he says, yes, I will go. But he doesn't go. So Jesus says, um, which of the two did the will of the father? And they said to him, well, the first. And Jesus says, yes, assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. Because they said, no, no, and they were bad, but eventually they went. And, and so that's, there's a, God doesn't care when you do it. He just cares that you do it. And he doesn't care. See, he, he doesn't care if you say, oh, yes, Lord, yes, but you never do what he says. That, that doesn't impress him. So giving lip service and us saying to the Lord, oh, we love you, Lord, and yes, and I, but we never do what he says. Eh. But even the people who initially reject Christ, if they eventually change their mind and go, you know what, I'm going to receive it. It could be after 50 years of doing horrible stuff. It could be after 80 years of doing horrible stuff. They eventually change their mind and say, okay, I'm going to do what God's asking me to do. He says, those people, tax collectors, because they hated them some tax collectors, harlots, he said, they're entering the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you didn't believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe it. I mean, you saw people getting saved. You saw their lives, and you still wouldn't change. So uh, he's being really clear. We don't have to wonder, is this about Israel becoming a nation? Is this about the end of the day? No, this is about the destruction that's going to come on the temple right then. Okay. And again, People are still waiting for this seven-year tribulation period, and, and Jesus is going to make sure we understand that period began then. It's not something that's going to happen someday. Okay, in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1 through 8, there's another parable about the, the vineyard. It says, now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and he cleared out its stones and he planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in the midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes. That just says grapes, I didn't say good, but grapes. But it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then would I... When I expected it to bring forth good grapes, it just says grapes. Did I did it bring forth wild grapes? So you got grapes and you got wild grapes. And now, please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it shall be burned. So I'm going to take away its protection. It's going to be burned. And I'll break down its wall and it'll be trampled on, right? So I've been protecting it. I've had a wall around it. I'm going to take it down. And now it's going to be trampled on. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug not nah, too late but there shall come up briars and thorns and i will command the clouds that they may not rain on it for the vineyard of the lord of hosts 
is the house of Israel. In case you don't know what I'm saying, let me be really clear. The vineyard is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his plant that's growing up. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. So woe to those who join house to house. They add field to field. So here now, here's what this means. And it's kind of scary for us. People were taking advantage. God, the land had been divided up so that everybody had some land, but they were finding ways to take other people's lands and get them in debt. And and and, and God had even worked out this year of Jubilee. Okay, if you're in debt, 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 we excuse you. We're going to forgive your debt the 50th year so you can get your stuff back because God's not wanting people to be poor and in this horrible debt. So we are going to forgive your debt every 50 years so you can get your land back. And they would find ways to ignore that. And they would join house to house. And they would just build up their empire until they just had every house in the community. And they're all a bunch of poor people living out in the outskirts. And he says, so woe to those who build house to house, who find ways to take other people's land. And you just build this big conglomeration. And I didn't make this up. God made it up. And field to field. So you're just taking over everything and draining the people of their resources so they have nothing and you have everything until there is no place where they may dwell, it said, alone in the midst of the land, but the better translation with, with that they may dwell, uh, that they may, yeah, so they may dwell alone. They're by themselves in the land, right? You're the only one there. Everyone else is living up in the hills because they can't, and not the nice hills. I'm just, I mean, you know, living out in the desert and because you own everything. So God's actually not in favor of, People just taking up everything from everybody and taking all their resources. So he's warning Israel at that time about that. Did they stop? No. So eventually he he, he destroys the temple. So now Jesus is saying, here's how I'm going to destroy the second temple. He's still in the temple. He's cursed the temple, cursed the fig tree, come back to the temple. He says, here's another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and he set a hedge around it dug a wine press in it and built a tower, right? It sounds like he's talking about Israel, like he's talking about Isaiah. And he leased it to vine dressers and he went to a far country. Now, when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the wine dressers that they might receive its fruit. You know, it's his vine dresser. He simply gave it to them to tend for him. Now I'm going to go back. I want some wine. Now it says uh, the vine dressers took his servants and beat one, killed one, stoned another. So again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, he sent his son to them saying, oh, surely they will respect my son. Surprise. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is his heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? So Jesus is asking him, okay, so he keeps sending people and sending people and they keep ignoring and finally sends the son and they kill the son. So when the vine dresser shows up, what do you think he's going to do? Well, they said to him in verse 41, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vine vineyard to other vine dressers who will render him the fruits in their seasons. And Jesus said to them, so have you never read in the scriptures, the stone with the builders rejected? This has become the chief cornerstone. And that's an interesting parable because the very cross you're about to put me on that's going to bring your destruction. That same cross is a cross that's going to bring salvation to the world. So the stone that you're looking at and saying, no, and rejecting that stone, that's the stone I'm going to build my kingdom on. It's the very same stone. So because this was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Have you ever heard that? Well, therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. So you're not bearing fruit. So you want to be clear. You're the fig tree not bearing fruits. You're not bearing fruit. So I don't want you to misunderstand. What does that fig tree mean? It means um, judgment. I'm going to take this from you and give it to a nation that does bear fruit. So Jesus is clear about what the parable of the fig tree meant. So even though we read all these, the fig tree means when Israel becomes a nation again. No, it means when Israel is destroyed. When the, when the, not, when the temple is destroyed and the covenant breakers are judged. Matthew chapter 21, verse 46. Now, when the tree, chief priest and the Pharisee heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. 
So they weren't confused. He thought, I think he's talking about us. So they're clear. He's talking about us. Everybody's clear. He's talking about them. Okay. So this parable of the fig tree is not about some future Israel someday. It's specifically talking about Israel in the years between 30 AD and Jesus is about to be crucified. He's crucified in 30 AD and then 70 AD, that 40 year period of judgment. Just like in the wilderness, there was a 40 year period of judgment and those covenant breakers who came over covenant deniers. They didn't even want the covenant. No, we don't want that. Who came over from Egypt, who refused to go cross over the Jordan. That group died out, that generation, that 40 year period for that generation to die out and be judged. And then those who were to continue on crossing the promised land. And it's the same thing. You get in 40 years, there's a whole generation that's going to, the generation that sees this from 30 AD to 70 AD. In 70 AD, this temple is going to be destroyed. He, they knew he was talking about them. They didn't think he was talking about some future generation 2,000 years later. He's talking about them. So in Matthew 24, verse 32, it says, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer's near. So you can tell when the fig trees, and it tells you when summer's near. So, so it says, so you also, when you see all these things that I've warned you about, earthquakes and false Christ in the deserts and the mountains, and then you see the lightning flash from the east to the west and, and the army surrounding. When you see all of these things, every single thing that I've mentioned, it says, know that it is near at the door. What's near at the door? They ask Jesus, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So know that the end of the Jewish age, the end of the age where Israel was occupied by by the Gentiles, and the church age is about to begin. So know that that whole age is, is done. They said, once the sign of the end of the age, he says, now you'll know that these things are near, and you'll know that it's even at the doors. Assuredly, in verse 34, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So I don't want us to be unclear. This generation will no means pass away until all these things I'm talking about. When I said there should be great tribulation, that it was talking about that generation, not ours. Again, it's taught that this tribulation is coming in our time. But Jesus said he was talking to them, specifically to them, about the tribulation that was coming in their time. This generation that sees this shall in no means pass away till all these things takes place. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will no mind, by no means pass away. So uh, be uh, before you doubt my words, know that we, we'll, we, heaven and earth would be gone. So uh, as long as you see heaven and earth still here, Know that what I'm saying to you is going to take place. This generation that sees this. But of the day and hour, specific day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. So exactly when it's going to happen. But I'm telling you all the signs. And when you see the armies surrounding Israel come off the roof, go to the mountains. If you're into the field, go. And we're about to talk about the rapture. That's the next thing that he addresses and how that has been also misinterpreted. But we're going to look right at Jesus' words. He's, he's very clear. And I'm only going over this over and over because at least half the body of Christ today is, is thinking that these words are about the time that we live in today. And they thought that over and over. They thought that in the 1800s, in, in 1799. They all sat waiting for Jesus to come back again and destroy everything. And then in 1899, as it go, went over to 900, people were, and just, you know, and Y2K, people were predicting the end of the world because they've been misinterpreting this scripture for years. But Jesus is only talking about that generation. The other parts of the Bible talk about the future, but this passage, which has been used to scare people for years, is only talking about the destruction that's coming on that temple, and that fig tree represents a curse on that temple 
Jesus is really plain. He gave them examples, and he says, this nation is going to be, this be taken from you and given to a nation that will bear fruit. And they, they said, they perceive you talking about us. Yes, I'm talking about you. So this big tree represents you and what I'm going to do to you. Okay. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels and father in heaven, but my father only. So we're going to go on from there because uh, we're going to look at scriptures talking about then two shall be in the field and one shall be taken and uh, other left and we want to, so what does that mean is that is that the rapture of the church and we'll go on from there so thank you again for listening i really appreciate it and um i will see some of you and i keep saying see on sunday uh where we are in genesis and isaac has just gotten a wife his wife rebecca he's about to have adventures himself and then he's about, he's going to have two kids. Uh, and so we, we are studying and moving through Genesis, moving through Matthew at my glacial place. But I, I appreciate your patience. And God bless. I'll see you soon. Talk to you soon.